Hello, boys and girls. Happy Monday. Well, we got a little random assortment for you today. I uh, gotta catch you up on a few things. Um, so as per tradition, let's uh, enjoy a cold one of the drink of Unboxing Champions. And uh, let's get into it. First up was actually not a... wasn't a purchase, but it was... Um, something that my good friend Esmeralda James let me borrow, uh, which was uh, Black Christmas, the 2006 version on DVD. The Blu-ray of this does exist, but it is really, really expensive for some reason, more so than it's worth, and I think, well, it's out of print, but also, uh, yeah, I guess it's just not only out of print, but rare with within the within the pantheon of out of print things, but yeah, I'll need to watch this. Might even do this for like a Christmas in July or something like that. Now in terms of things that actually did arrive that were mine, um, three things came from Amazon. Um, one of which I had not seen before, and that was the new version of The Invisible Man, and I watched it last night. It was good, you know, I'm, I was a big fan of the original Invisible Man from 1933, and this definitely does something new with the basic concept of a man that's invisible. Um, you know, it's definitely, well, it's got the sci-fi in there, but it is very much rooted in horror. And uh, Leigh Wynell, you know, he may know from Insidious and from Saw, um, you know, he writes and directs this one, and I think this could be his best directorial work by far, and very good screenplay, too. Um, one thing I'll say about it is that, well, you know, it's a film that, I mean, I think this is all pretty readily apparent. Actually, yeah, it's not a spoiler at all, but, um, it's something that, um, if you've ever dealt with a, like, a spouse or a romantic partner of any kind that is obsessive and abusive and stalkerish and doesn't ever leave you alone and is controlling or whatever, then this will most definitely speak to that because it's all about that experience. It just so happens that the stalker in question also happens to be invisible. But um, yeah, if you've ever dealt with that, as I know, and I know many people who have, then if you do decide to watch this, then definitely make sure that you're emotionally ready for it because if you have a lot of trauma surrounding it the event still then it might you know remind you of them but in and of itself it's like this does really speak to that experience brilliantly and it's it's quite chilling um and then next up is uh the mask of zorro in 4k which i'm so glad that this got a 4k beautiful slip cover here i wasn't really sure of how much i liked the slip cover design or not but uh, then seeing it in person, I was like, yeah, I like this. Um, I didn't think I would because, you know, see, I I do like this uh, on the inside here. I really like that. Um, but at any rate, you know, it's good to have a slip for it. And I like that they're actually, you know, because that's a pet peeve of mine is when the slip cover and the inside artwork, when they're the exact same, it's like, why bother? You know, do something different. Um, but anyway, uh, this, this film here... I think is, so, well, it is it is beloved, but it's also, um, oh yeah, so it's Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, which I could be wrong, but weren't they the screenwriters for the Pirates of the Caribbean films later on? I think so. And Martin Campbell, who we all know from GoldenEye and Casino Royale and Green Lantern. Um, but this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic film. Um, some people have kind of wondered, uh, does Zorro count as a superhero? Um, I don't know, because I well, I think you kind of have to measure any kind of character like that. Like, you have to, like, he's in a, Zorro's in a similar category to someone like Robin Hood, I think, um, in the, you know, Spanish-speaking world, but, like, um, I think it, uh, you know, you would have to measure superheroes as, like, everything pre-Superman, and then everything from Superman onward, you know, you could even more easily lump into the superhero category, because Superman was technically the first official superhero that we know of and think of today. But as far as, like, proto-superheroes, then yeah, the Mask of Zorro would definitely uh, count, and especially because, well, 
he was a direct influence on Batman uh, as a uh, the concept of the character and in fact in a lot of incarnations the movie that Bruce wants to go to so badly uh, that you know young Bruce that they go it's actually the mark of Zorro the whatever that was the 40s film um, but it was uh, you know Bruce really wanted to see the movie badly and then parents get shot and then you know, um, you know, he goes on to become Batman, but the connection is established very early on. So I'd call, I'd call Zorro more of like a proto superhero, but not quite. I don't know. It's just hard to like retroactively apply those kinds of labels um, when the superhero as we know of today, you know, that was created with Superman. But anyway, Last of the Amazon Things was one of my favorite movies of all time. Barton Fink. I think, hands down, the Coen Brothers' best film. It um, won, like, three different awards at the Cannes Film Festival, including, you know, the uh, the top prize, the Palme d'Or. And um, it, I just, I can't even put it, it's hard to even put into words how, well, not only how good the film is, but just how, it's a movie that defies genre. It really does, because it's got, um... It's got parts horror movie, part dark comedy, part buddy comedy, part murder mystery, part Hollywood satire. Um, you know, it's like the the writer's journey kind of film. Uh, it's the Germanic word uh, King Strowman, or I, that's probably wrong, but it's the yeah, it's the writer's journey kind of movie of the the artist becoming a better version of himself. You know, it's kind of all those things rolled into one. Um, I think that there are, are enough horror elements in this to where you could probably make a good argument for it being a horror film. Um, but again, it just, it really just defies genre, to be honest. That's part of what I love about it, but also just the mood is so creepy. Um, the But the, the satire, the humor, when it happens, is quite funny and quite dead-on accurate relative to the Hollywood screenwriting scene of the 1940s and relative to the stage, uh, the Broadway stage at that time. Because uh, the basic premise is that you've got a Broadway playwright, Barton Fink, played by John Turturro, expertly. Um, you have him, he's a, a playwright, and he gets invited over to Hollywood from New York City, goes over there to write screenplays, and he's like kind of Full of himself pretentious and he doesn't really know how to uh, write a script which at that time they were considered to be kind of movies were sort of like carny almost carny entertainment kind of beneath the you know the the prestige of the theater uh, even though you'd have you had films like Gone with the Wind you had you know these big epic films you had you know that had a big box office grosses and a lot of critical recognition and you know all that stuff the movies still were not, I mean, they, they had a prestige to them in their earlier days, but like in comparison to the theater, the theater was more uh, established. And so for him to do that, you know, he comes over and he's totally out of his element. And his next door neighbor, played by John Goodman, in my favorite performance of his, um, he, he just, uh, there's a lot of, I don't even want to spoil it, but it's just there's a lot of strange happenings that take place in the hotel. Um, and so definitely, uh, watch it. Uh, I really don't want to say anymore because it's best when you go in blind for a movie like that. Uh, it's very weird though, but that's why I love it because we love weird and wacky things. So we got three, uh, packages here. Um, let's start with this one, which, um, it says priority airmail. Um, and I'm trying to figure out where it might have come from. I'm not sure. Um, we're going to find out. I was trying to see if it was a UK one because I'm still waiting on that last Zabby uh, steelbook, The Cabin in the Woods. And uh, there it is right there. Perfect. Speak of the devil. Um, yeah, Cabin in the Woods, the Zabby exclusive steelbook. We're going to open that right up. Um, I remembered when this came out. I was in college. I didn't see it until a little bit later. Um, but I remembered... Uh, you know, there were a lot of people in my film classes who really looked down on horror films, um, but they all tended to really love Joss Whedon and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and they liked 
they were kind of the people I'm thinking of. They were kind of obsessed with meta humor to a kind of ridiculous degree, um, which you know, not to meta humor has its place, but it's just like for me, what that kind of taught me in that in those college days was that I meta humor, at least amongst the people that I knew, it seemed to be almost like an excuse for it's like I don't have any good ideas of my own, so I'm just gonna comment and criticize you know, comment on and criticize that which already exists instead of really committing myself to something that I believe in. Um, and now granted, the meta humor in this uh, is done very well. Um, but I just I noticed amongst the people I knew in college that they kind of use that as a crutch. And I don't think that that's a good thing um, as a writer. But at any rate, um, it's not to say it can't be done well, because it was done well here. Um, and especially it is a very kind of loving homage to various horror subgenres. And, um, yeah, most of you have probably seen it by now, but this is the Zavi exclusive steelbook there. I like that you can see the, the grid of the, uh, little dome thing that they, uh, set up. But, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the film. I have not seen it in forever, but I remembered liking it. Um, again, I'm just... Even Scream, which I really like the Scream films, but I like them for different reasons than I think a lot of people do. Like, the mainstream tended to like the Scream films because they made fun of all the slasher tropes, and they were they were worth making fun of at that time. What I really liked about the Scream films was I liked the characters, and I liked the fact that our main cast, that you actually get to see them grow up, you know, and go through all these big life changes. I like because that's something that I never liked about Friday the 13th, was that any character that you could maybe kind of sort of get invested in gets killed off right away. Um, but with Scream, it's like you really get to know these people, and you get to see them grow and change, and it's like, hey, that's nice. Um, but yeah, the meta humor, like, there's there's a fine line where it just becomes irritating. But I think Cabin in the Woods overall does it well. Um, next up is Movie Mars uh, from Indian Trail, North Carolina, once again. Um, uh, pretty nice that it can come so close. Um, and I cannot remember exactly which one I got from them. Uh, which one was this? I can't remember. Um, oh yeah. So, in our series about, um, black exploitation films, we've got one, um, that I remembered seeing in college. I really liked it. Um... The I'll say this, the full title of this film is consists of a word that if I said it, I would be shot on the spot, um, so I'm not even going to say it, but um, anyway, the, the title on the DVD is Boss, um, the other word is the N-word it is, um, but, uh, you know, it's... I think it, despite its black exploitation title, it's a really good movie. It really is. Like I'm not even kidding. It's a film that uh, basically, if you took the plot of Blazing Saddles as far as like a black sheriff in a white town and as he has to face prejudice while also trying to do the right thing, if you took the plot of that spoof film and did it seriously then you'd get this film. And so this one, it says 1975, and actually it was, um, Blazing Saddles was 1974, so it's kind of a funny comparison, but yeah, it's basically that same plot, except obviously more grounded and without all the spoof elements. Um, but, uh, you know, that basic plot, it's, it's done really well. The action's done really well. You know, and it's like the, the, um, the western genre and the action genre can often come together very nicely and um, I think it really holds up. I've not seen it in forever but uh, there's the inside cover there. There's the full title which I'm not even gonna not even gonna utter the words but uh, at any rate just so just for the sake of clarity there it is. Um, but it's uh, it's a legitimately great film. I would highly recommend it. Um, I've not seen it in, I want to say like nine years or so, um, but I remembered really liking it. So definitely check it out. Um, and it definitely, well, we, I'm going to get more um, Fred Williamson films because he, talking about, you know, the genre that made a lot of stars um, 
that he was one of the luminaries of that genre. Um, and he was in, um, uh, From Dusk Till Dawn, uh, which Tarantino wrote and acted in, but he did not direct. That was Robert Rodriguez. Um, so, but yeah, he did manage to pay homage to him a little bit in there. Um, and I think he's been in some other stuff, but, uh, yeah, I think he did amazing in that film. And then last up, we got, um, San Marcos, California. And, uh... Oh, we're getting fancy today. Look at that. It's a fancy box. Um, it looks kind of like, uh, and it is to me, so it's not my roommate again. So it says, uh, Lennox and, um, Winter Greetings Cheese Plate with Knife. Oh boy. And that's not at all what we're going to find inside, but still. Props on the unique, uh, box. Um... I'm impressed. But uh, anyway, let's go ahead and see what's in the box. Um, do you guys ever reuse boxes and envelopes and things? Because I reuse them all the time. Because I'm not buying another one. I'm just going to tape over the one that I already have. Um, and I know exactly why this particular item was shipped in this box. Um, because of its shape. And uh, it says, Dear user, thank you for your recent acquisition. Enjoy your time on the grid. Well, that should give you a little hint as to what this movie is. Or movies, I should say. That was very creative. I'm impressed. Um, well, what could it be? What could it be? It is uh, Tron, the original, and Tron Legacy together in this awesome... Um, I think it was the dual disc or whatever they're called. I um, can't remember. Whatever they're called. Um it's inside this packaging. Now, he said that he w had replaced the batteries on this thing, and maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, but anyway, so you've got inside of there, you got all the discs there, which, how many of you liked Tron? Um, I'm trying to see if I can't. Yeah, I might have to go in there and look and see what batteries it takes. But anyway, um, how many of you guys really like Tron? Because, boy, I love the Tron films, both of them. Um, and a lot of people kind of put down the the um, the second one, Tron Legacy. I don't. Like, I think it's legitimately pretty great. Um, it does cover off some of the same territory as the first one. Um, but I think that there's enough good stuff that's unique in it. Um, especially when it comes to, like, the... Um, Basically, like, the whole crux of it, well, I don't, I don't know how much I should say, but, like, basically the whole crux of, well, both films, um, they're surprisingly more complex than you might think, um, but the crux of the, those films, they're all about how, um, within this virtual world, how these computer programs have sentience and can believe in users almost like, you know, the, the users, like, you know, humans, can kind of believe in them almost like gods and have them with reverence. Um, but then also within that world that um, life can potentially, you know, spontaneously generate and other programs can uh, achieve, you know, they can go rogue or, you know, things like that. It's a little bit like what um, the latter two Matrix films, especially Matrix Revolutions, um, it's kind of what they were getting at, you know, as far as the machines beginning to act more human-like than they ever have. Um, and in this case, you know, sorry, this this thing is kind of persnickety, but um, doesn't this remind you of like a portable CD player, just the way it kind of opens and shuts like that? How many of you out there are old enough to remember portable CD players? I know I am old enough to remember them. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it touches on quite a lot of very, very interesting ideas. Um, both of them do. Um, both of them have really great soundtracks. The first was done by Wendy Carlos. The second was done by Daft Punk, um, which most people know that. And, um, you know, they both, I think, were visually stunning for their times. Um, the first one was revolutionary because of what it it made use of the Pixar computer, which obviously that went on to um, serve as the foundation for what would eventually become Pixar animation, uh, animated uh, 
studios and uh, thus, you know, would lay the foundation for Toy Story and everything after that. But, you know, it wouldn't have been possible without Tron. And then the sequel there, yeah, it's a lot of CGI, but it's actually integrated very, very well. And, um, yeah, I just, I, I love the Tron films. I would love to have them make another one. I don't know if it'll happen, but I think that would be really, really cool. If not another movie, then why not, like, a Disney Plus original series? Like, if anything, I think Tron might benefit from having some room to really spread out its ideas. But anyway... We got a good uh, good spread there, a bunch of interesting things. So, yeah, if you like this, then uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon, like, share, subscribe. Set phasers to stun, warp factor 5. I realize I just said subscribe twice, but that's okay. And um, I will see you in the next video, and I am going to enjoy my drink of Unboxing Champions because I am parched.